Hey, welcome back to AP Precalc. This is section 1.2. We're talking about rates of change. And we're going to start out with the average rate of change. Now, this is something you've done before. I don't know if you want to believe me or not, but let's fill this in. Average rate of change. Have you heard of slope before in the past? Slope? You remember slope back in eighth grade. Slope is the change in the dependent variable for every change in the x. Okay, or change in y over change in x. And we're going to introduce this new symbol here. This is delta. And what delta means is the change in. So this little triangle, it's Greek letter, delta. All right, means change in y over change in x. Sometimes they use that delta in chemistry. It just, it's a shorthand. It's a quick way to write it. But you probably have seen y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Just make sure that the dependent variables are always on top. Okay, it's wise for the dependent variables to be on top. That's right, the y's are on top. So we're going to start with number one, find the average rate of change. So we know now that just means the slope between 1, 2, and 3, 4, the points. And here's the function up here. So let's plot those two points down. So here are the points labeled on our wonderful graph, 1, 2, and 3, 4. The average rate of change. We want to know between these two points, what is the rate of change? And you can look at it, and you can tell that the rate of change changes a little bit, right? So we want an average rate of change, and to do that, we're just going to find the slope. So I'm going to do my best there to approximate. If we draw a straight line through those two points, that'll give us an average rate of change. It's a little bit less than the, the rate of change here, but it's a little bit more. It's a little greater than the rate of change up here. It's the average rate of change. How are we going to show that? Well, we're just going to write out our formula. The average rate of change is going to equal, and just like we did a long time ago, we're going to say y2 minus y1 all over x2 minus x1. Now, some things I'm going to point out, and again, you probably know this. Uh, the first point, we need to designate each point as x1, y1, and x2, y2. And it really doesn't matter which one you do, because if you do it in a different order, then essentially what happens is the top and the bottom, the negatives all switch, and it ends up giving you the same answer. You can trust me on that. But I always like to choose the point with the larger numbers uh, to be x2, all right, and then y2. And then the other point will be x1, y1. Okay, now uh, when we substitute this all in, what are we going to get? We take the y value, so it's going to be 4 minus 2 all over 3 minus 1. And you have done this before. As I said, I don't want to keep reiterating that, but we get 2 over 2, which is 1. That is the average rate of change. Now, can we take a second? You don't have to write this down, but I want to play the what if game. What if? What if we didn't designate the first point to be x1, y1, and the second one to be x1? What if we switch that? Because students always say, how do I know which one is which? Let's pretend like we made this one x1 and y1. Now they have to match. These two coordinates have to match. They have to be in the same point. But what if we just switched it? What would that look like mathematically? And so when we sub it in our formula here, we're going to have the same formula, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. All right, what would that give us? So in this case, we would do what? We'd do 3. Uh, no, we wouldn't. We would do 1 minus 3 on the bottom because the x always goes on the bottom. And on the top, we look at it, we'd have 2 minus 4. If you look and notice, we're going to get a negative 2 over negative 2. And notice those negatives cancel. That's going to give you 1. So the moral of the story is it doesn't matter which point is x1, y1, which point is x2, y2. You can just plug in the formula. That will always work as long as these guys match up. So if you notice like 2 over 1, that comes from 1, 2 here. Okay, and then 3 over 4. All right, enough of the what if. You didn't have to write that down. I'm just proving it to you. Instead of a graph, let's say we have a table of values. You want to calculate the average rate of change on an interval. Be careful with the output values. They always have to be. Remember, output are the y values. The y values always have to be in the numerator, which is in top. So here's number two that says, what is the average rate of change, or the slope, on the interval from 13 to 25? So really, these two columns are what we're looking at. We have time and distance. Now, generally, we have to figure out which is our independent, which is our dependent. So time here is going to be our independent, because you can see that d of t, okay, t is like the independent variable. That's the one that has to go in the bottom. So remember, I'm going to write our formula down y2 minus y1 all over x2 minus x1 and that is the average rate of change so this would equal all right now be careful dependent has to be on top and remember i like to have bigger numbers first but sometimes it's not possible because look this one's bigger on the x and on the y it's smaller so i'm just going to roll with it 
So we're going to take the point 25, 30. The 30 goes on top, minus 76, all over 25 minus 13. Now some students might be saying, well, how do you know which numbers and where to get them? If it's easier, let's just write this as a coordinate point. We'll write it as 13, 76, and we'll write this one as 25, 30. And now we can see we're going to do 30 minus 76, 25 minus 13. That might make it easier for you if you need to do that. All right, we're going to work this all out. What is 30 minus 76? I get negative 46 for that. 25 minus 13 is 12. And very, very important. The word per is a key indicator that you are dealing with a rate of change. Miles per gallon, students per classroom, online gamers per server. It tells you which variable is dependent or independent. So we have to make sure that we include our units. So in the top here are the y values. That was the distance in meters. So it's negative 46 meters per every 12 seconds. Okay, or we can work that out if we're gonna divide that out in the calculator. I get when I put it in my calculator, negative 3.833. We're gonna go out three places meters per second. Okay, and we're gonna write that out with our units. You can abbreviate if it's standard units there. Pretty easy, right? I mean, we're just dealing with slope here. Okay, next let's talk about the rate of change at a single point. What about the rate of change of a function at a point? This tells us about the rate at which the output values would change were the input values to change at that point. We can approximate the rate of change by using an average rate of change over really tiny intervals that contain the point. To illustrate this, what I'm gonna do, here's our function that we were working with. I wanna to go to a website called GeoGebra. You might be familiar with it. And they have a graphing calculator that you can put in the function, which I did right here. And what I wanna do is I'm just gonna put two points. If you hit point, you can just click on here and it'll put a point on the function. You know, here are two points. And if I wanted to find the average rate of change, then I would find the slope of these two, right? I would find the slope. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a line. How do we do that? Here's line. I'm gonna go through A and through B. Okay, so as we move these points closer together, suppose I wanna know, oop, I don't wanna do that. So, suppose I wanna know what the average rate of change is at point A. Now, if you notice, look at the curve. It's pretty steep, right? I mean, cause we're talking about the slope. And if I use point A and point B, then my estimate is not really gonna be close to what the slope is right at point A. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna move this a little bit closer to A. And notice how this line, the slope of it, is pretty close to what the slope is at point A. And then after we move it that close, we're gonna move it this close. And then we're gonna move it this close. And if we get those two points very close together, then we can approximate the average rate of change at that single point as they become on top of each other and essentially become the same point. That's what we're gonna do in this part of the packet. So it says estimate the rate of change at x equals one. Okay, so to estimate the rate of change at x equals one, I'm gonna pick two points that are very close together. How about one will have x equals one and x equals two. And I'll plug both of those into our function here. And if I do that, you can take my word for it, but I'm gonna get for x equals one, a point of one, two. And for x equals two, I'll get two comma 3.5. Now, sometimes I show a lot of work here. Pause the video if you need to, to some time, you know, to write that down. But here's our slope formula, average rate of change. We work it all out, we get 1.5. And that represents the average rate of change between the straight line that would connect these points. That is the best job I could do, not too bad. But estimating the rate of change becomes more and more accurate as these points get closer together. So instead of using an x value of one and an x value of two, let's use an x value of one and another x value of 1.1. What would that look like? Well, to help us out, this is hard calculations. We're gonna use our calculator. So I'm gonna go back to the calculator. I've already done some stuff, but I'm gonna quit. I'm gonna show you, this is our first little calculator. If we do second, and then memory, which is above the plus sign, and seven, one, 
two. That will help us clear the RAM. You only have to do this if this isn't your calculator and you're not really quite sure how to, you know, the settings could be messed up. But I just cleared the memory out. We're going to plug in this function. We're going to make sure we use our parentheses. Where'd that function go? It's all the way over here. So use your parentheses and it's negative one half. I always put parentheses around fractions. It's a great idea. Here's the X and the squared button. I'm just going to use this little carrot that works for exponents. You could also use this button right here. So we have negative one half X squared plus three. Go back to the X and we subtract, use your parentheses, one half. All right, so here's our function and we put it in Y1. That's going to be important later. But if I were to go to the table, see where the table is here? It's in blue on mine. You hit second and then table. It gives you a table of values starting at zero. One is two. We already knew that. And then two is 3.5. We knew that so on and so forth all the way down. You can scroll down, you can scroll up, as long as your cursor's on that input value right there. Well, that helps us plug numbers in, but what I wanna do is get these points closer together, so I wanna use x equals one and x equals 1.1. How can I come up with that 2.195, which is the output for 1.1? Now, there are ways you can change the settings in the table, so I'll show you how to do that right now. We go second, table set, Okay, this first number tells you where you want to start the table. So negative two is, I guess, okay. But uh, let's go down to this one here, which is the most important. It says delta table. Now we learned earlier today, delta means change in. We want the table to change in tenths because I want to go to 1.1. And you know what? I could start this at one. That'd probably make our life easier. So this says start at one and change by tenths. So if I go back to the table, check this out. It starts at one and it's changing by tenths, the input value. So that gives us our 2.195. Easy enough. Now, I could also do this as we work, let's work this out, work it out, work it out. Oh, there we go. Plug it all in, we get a slope of 1.95. That's if we have the two points so close together. If we move that all the way down to here, uh, we get a different slope. It's a little more steep than it would be. As this point moves away, then the slope decreases, but as they come closer together, the slope increases. Well, that's pretty cool, but I'm gonna show you one more thing in your calculator because what you don't wanna do is have to you know, change the table settings. Let's go ahead and get these points so close together. How close? Real close. Let's go 1.001. Now, we could change our table. That's not difficult. Let's do it, table set. We just go down here to the change in table, 0.001. And when we do that, we can go up to the table and it gives us a value. But let me tell you a little problem with this. If we scroll over, we notice down here it says the Y value or the output for 1.001 is actually a little bit, this is longer, this has been, uh, we'll say it's been rounded to 2.002, .002, right? So I'm going to show you another trick. Not a lot of teachers use this, but I love it. I'm going to be honest, I love it. If you go to the home screen, which is where you quit, and there's nothing there, that's fantastic. Go to where it says VARS, that stands for variables. I wanna pull up that Y variable, so I go over to the right, it's a function, there's Y1. You remember we plugged the function into Y1, so now using function notation, you can just plug in an input value and it'll tell you the output. It'll just plug that number into the equation. So if I want Y1, that's right, I mean that's where we're at, Y1's where our function is, so if I wanna plug in a 1.001, .001, I'm gonna scroll up to Y1. I can just grab that again and do 1.001, .001, and it's going to give me the output value. Then it's very simple. I can do some math where I go grab that output. We subtract the other output, right? Or you can just type two, and you divide it by, you gotta go the same order, you gotta be careful, but 1.001 .001 minus one, that's just 0.001. And that's going to give me an answer of 1.995. But of course, I'm going to show that, right? So I'm going to show all that out. Now, an important conversation we need to have. We get the slope is equal to uh, 1.9995, but we want to go out three places. So what do I do? Well, one option is you can round. Oh, well, that's not this option. That's the second option. So the, the second option here, you can round it. So if you're going to round, you look at the third, okay, you got to look at the fourth. That's a five or higher, so this has to go up. When nine goes up, it's going to a 10. So you move that over, that goes up, that goes up, that goes up. You're gonna end up with 2.000. 000. 
Awesome. Or the other option is you can truncate. Truncate means you can just cut it off and we're good to go. Either option is acceptable. We'll take them both. So you either put 1.999 or 2.000. Those are our two options when you go out to the nearest thousandth when you're changing those two. So now it's your turn. Try it any way you want to. You can use your calculator however you want. You can use a table. You can use a function notation as I showed you, but you're gonna do number four all by yourself. Go to the nearest thousandth. That's what we want, this part right here. You wanna be very, very accurate. So you're gonna have a very, very small change in the X. Okay, so my approximation for the rate of change, I got uh, the slope equal to 0.135, and that's from Here's a screenshot. I put the function in and then I plugged in a negative two and a negative 2.001, which be mindful, that's on the left, right? Because that's smaller, but it doesn't matter. And then I go ahead and find the slope and I get, uh, what was my answer here? 0.13526. So I can cut that right off. I can either round it or truncate it. Same answer either way. All right, that's number four. One more part left, super easy. So our very last part, and then I promise we're all done, talks about positive and negative rates of change or positive and negative slope. A positive rate of change means that as one quantity increases or decreases, the other quantity does the same. Another way of thinking about this is as X increases, Y also increases. So think of a graph as one variable increases here, the other variable increases on this side. It gives you some type of, you know, positive. It grows, it's going uphill from left to right. You ever play Mario Brothers? It means Mario's running uphill. Uh, a negative rate of change indicates that as one quantity increases, or as the X increases, the other decreases. So it goes down like this, or Mario would be running downhill left to right. So pause the video right now and try to figure out whether uh, five and six would be positive or negative based on what they tell you. Go, pause the video. Okay, so for number five, did you get positive? Because as years increase, all right, let's put the years down here. So as years increase, then a high school student body, we'll just put B for body, that also increases, so it looks something like this. It's positive. However, number six, as Mr. Bean's weight decreases, which means as we go left on the x-axis, his running distance increases. So it kind of looks like this. As we go left, it goes up. And that's it. That's positive and negative rate of change. But we know that from positive slope and negative slope. That's about it. Good luck on your mastery check students. And remember, it's always nice to be important, but it's more important to be nice. See you.